Well, welcome again to the Pandemic Baseball Book Club. I'm Jim Obermeyer, and I'm doing an interview today with Bill Nowlin, whose new book, Working a Perfect Game, a, has come out by, published by Summer Game Books. It's a book about umpires. Bill is a, a member of the Sabre Society for American Baseball Research Board of Directors and a former vice president. And in his, uh, when he's not writing his own books, he is editing Sabre historic publications, which turn up in my inbox on an amazingly regular and frequent basis. So, Bill, I'll turn this over to you. And first of all, the name of the book is Working a Perfect Game. But what does that mean? Well, let me show, first of all, I'll start off by showing the book to uh, some folks. I know that the book club will put it up on the website, but it's real. That's what it looks like. It's got a lot of pages, a few pictures that I took mostly. Uh, it's uh, an odd title, Working a Perfect Game. It makes you think about a pitcher uh, who is throwing a no-hitter, or if they're lucky, one of the 23 people that ever did it, a perfect game. But one of the umpires told me that um, Tony Rondazzo, when I was talking to him, he said uh, how he just likes to work perfect games. And I said, well, anybody would, right? Uh, how Have you ever worked a perfect game? Because I thought he had not. Uh, and he sa said, let me explain what it means. It means as an umpire that you make all the calls correctly. You're in the right position to make all the calls. There's no controversies and uh, the game's done. There's, you haven't drawn unwanted attention to yourself. That's a perfect game. And they, they do get them sometimes. Uh, even umpires make mistakes, uh, as we've come to know. Uh, but most, and they do get graded after every game. Each umpire has access to a report. And they're always in the 96 or 97 range with really rare exceptions. Uh, but a perfect game is something to be sought after. Thanks. I, I have to say, I watched baseball for years, and I know there are umpires out there, and they do, they keep the game under control. They make the game happen, really. Uh, a lot. They make the game happen by the rules. But in terms of individuals, I got to say, I, I have to admit that most of the umpires I'm familiar with are ones who have aggressive reputations like Joe West in the present day, or going back in history, Bill Clem, who didn't take any golf from anybody, George Megakurth, who got in a few fistfights with players and fans, Jocko Conlon, who had a famous kicking contest with Leo DeRocher, or the umps who made historically awful calls like Don Denkinger and Jim Joyce. But uh, you make these guys sound like regular guys. Uh, more than that, really, a lot of them are very knowledgeable and well-spoken. And I, I should say that a good portion of this book is composed of transcripts of Bill's. Um, he sat down with these guys, usually the crew of four, and, and interviewed them. And they really like to talk. Did you know that they were going to be so... Um, voluble and helpful before you started? I, I had no idea. I really expected that most of them, knowing that they, they don't really want to be in the limelight, because usually if they are, it's, as you indicated, for unfortunate reasons. They got in too vociferous a fight or they built up a reputation of being argumentative. They don't really want to be in the limelight. If they can come in to a game and go home without anybody yelling, kill the ump or saying bad things, uh, that's, that's a good game. I thought most of them would be rather private and rather reluctant to talk. And I was very pleased that of the, let's see, I, I interviewed 72 major league umpires uh, over a four year period. Some of the ones that I interviewed at the beginning retired by the end and there'd been new guys that come in, but there's only 76 at any given time. I think over the span that I covered, there were probably 82 or 83, but Essentially, most of them agreed to an interview. Only f about five or six declined, and that was fine with me. A couple of call-up umpires declined, too, guys that are working AAA ball that were hoping to get promoted to the majors, and I expected them to 
to decline because they're looking for a job. Uh, and they might say one thing that was off uh, and that could ultimately cost them a job somehow. I, nobody really said anything like that, but um, I was very pleased with how forthcoming they were, how happy they were to talk about the nature of the work and their lives. Uh, I usually start off by asking them, how'd you get started in this? And there were, of course, a wide variety of responses by accident on a dare. My father was an umpire. I mean, you know, quite the whole range of uh, responses you might, uh, might expect. But then, you know, I got going, stepping through the process of how you become an umpire and then what the conditions are of work are today. Uh, you did most of the interviews at Fenway Park, I believe, uh, in the umpire's room there. So that was so, convenient to me since I had a written about writing. <laughs> and you've written about 20 books about the Red Sox. So like Fenway is like your home away from home when it's open. Right. So um, you know, it, was it difficult to get access to the, to the umps room or anything from the Red Sox? Yes, the uh, Red Sox have been very good to me over the years. Uh, and uh, I have regular media credentials. Uh, and the security people get to know me over time. Uh, had, uh, the head groundskeeper's office is right next door to the umpire's room. He and I have become kind of friendly. He's put out a couple of books himself. Uh, and uh, Dave Miller. But um, yeah, I just would go down about an hour, an hour and a half before a game and, uh, and wait for them to come in and then kind of waylay them and ask if I can uh, if spare time, and usually the first game of a homestand, maybe they don't want to, but I say, I, you know, I'd be happy to come back tomorrow night after you get settled uh, through the first game. And uh, as I said, al almost everybody agreed. Uh, it was at Fenway in the umpire's room, sometimes a group of four, sometimes two or three, sometimes a lot of solo ones. And occasionally guys said, listen, I, my, I've got people visiting tonight, but here's my phone number. Um, I'm going to be working replay next week. Can you, uh, give me a call. I mean, Tim Timmons, I actually did the interview as he walked for about 40 minutes from his hotel to the replay center. You know, he's stopping at traffic lights in downtown Manhattan. And uh, we we're talking about, about his, uh, his life. And it was a great interview. And then I caught up with him again when he, he came back to Boston. One thing that shocked me about the umpire room at Fenway when I went in, there's a table that they t tend to play cards at or have a, have a snack uh, before or after the games. And uh, there are four bright red Red Sox chairs in a circle around the table. <clears throat> and the first time I saw them, I said, how do they allow these chairs in here? How does Major League Baseball allow a Red Sox chair to be in the umpire's room? And one of them said, well, we didn't even notice that. Uh, and I said, well, no, maybe you should have an MLB logo on it. I said, well, the Red Sox, it's their place. They can put it in any chairs they want. But they were kind of oblivious to the... Uh, the fact that he was one team's, uh, you know, pr promoting themselves, so to speak, uh, on the back of the chair. One of the things I noticed, I'm talking about the basic agreeability and accessibility of these guys, you, you took most or all of the pictures of the Alps that are in the book. I have yeah, never I seen, I have no, I can't, Im well, I can't imagine seeing that many umpires smiling. They're all seem so happy. That was because I was taking their picture. No, <laughs> I don't know. They, uh, you know, they, they are, I think, for the most part, fairly normal people. Like I think most of us are. Uh, they've got. Uh, they come from a family, uh, varied backgrounds. Many of them working class family backgrounds, uh, and uh, they might have become law enforcement people. Uh, that's a, a common thought. I, I did ask almost every one of them, what do you think you would have done if you hadn't become a, an umpire? And, and that was the more common, that's maybe 10%, but more common response. A couple of people, you know, art, an art teacher, uh, two of them thought they would have gone into teaching art. And then different other professions, uh, stockbroker, one of them is an attorney. Uh, and uh, Dan Bellino is, is real estate law, uh, but he's got a doctor doctorate in it. They uh, have possibilities that some of them could have done, but uh, they, you know, they were happy enough to. Some some declined it, didn't want me to take their picture. We made there were a few jokes about, you know, don't take my picture while I'm sitting on the pot and things of that sort. But uh, I wasn't about to do that anyhow. 
Yeah, I was, there's a lot of college education there. And Bellino is an attorney and he said he got into real estate law because he could practice yeah. that remotely <laughs> because I'm and somehow do his, do his uh, legal work at the same time or more yeah, or less. His mother, his mother worked for a federal judge in, uh, I think it was in the Chicago area. And he was impressed. He said he'd wanted to go to law school ever since he was seven years old. And I, I asked him, I said, well, whatever possessed a seven-year-old kid to even conceive of the notion of going to law school. And he said it was because he's visiting his mother at work and all these sharply dressed uh, attorneys would, would come in to, uh, you know, file their paperwork or whatever. And it just, they just impressed him enough that that's what he decided he wanted to do. There's a PhD in the group, I believe, at least one, Dale Barrett. Ted Barrett, yes. Ted Barrett, uh, sorry. Yeah, he, that, that really surprised me. Um, I had known a little bit about him beforehand. I, obviously, before I would go talk to these guys, I'd look up on RetroSheet and, and try to get a sense of some of their background, who, they, who their first ejection was, how many ejections they had, where they were from. And, and then I tried to do a little research on the internet about them. And uh, Ted Barrett had, you don't want to mess with him. He was a sparring partner with, I think, five different former heavyweight boxing champions, not just flyweights, these are heavyweights, and he was a sparring partner. That means they valued his competition. And, you know, he did admit he got, suffered a little, a little bit as a result of it. He could, uh, be, and, the, he could be the modern day megacurth, except he keeps it under Yeah, control. I guess. <laughs> that would be discouraged by Major <laughs> League Baseball. But uh, yeah, he, he was, uh, he held his own there. He gave them a, a good enough battle to make it worthwhile, but didn't, you know, try to sucker punch them or anything like that, which would have uh, caused him to be uh, removed. But he then he also became an ordained minister. He has a PhD in theology, and so he he made it. He was a crew chief, and he said they made a joke. They call me Reverend Doctor Crew Chief Barrett. I suppose they don't call him that very often, but they probably just call him Ted. But. Uh, it was uh, kind of a shock to see an umpire that was a, uh, an ordained minister. He could have married somebody uh, later that day. Uh, he actually uh, does go on missions. I think him and Angel Hernandez have been a couple of times to Cuba on missions in the off season and have uh, uh, visited uh, folks down there and tried to minister to them or offer whatever advice they might uh, have or counsel. Uh, it was kind of a surprise. His, his dissertation was on the problems that umpires face because of the solitary lifestyle that they have. And that was another thing that impressed me from the beginning is with umpires, you've got this very small group. There are four of them that work any major league game. In the minor leagues, you might only have a two-man crew or a three-man crew. But when you get to AAA and the majors, it's usually a four-man crew. And those are the only people they travel with. They don't travel with a team of 25 players where you can hang out with a different guy every night. Uh, they have some ins and outs because they do have vacations. There's occasional injury or family crisis and the umpire has to leave the crew for a period of time and somebody comes in to replace him. But for the most part, for a given year, it's the group of four of you. And uh, you travel from city to city. You don't stay in the same city for more than four nights, unless you're lucky enough to work Chicago and have Cubs and White Sox games back to back, or a couple of the other cities that have uh, two team, well, three other cities, I guess, that have two teams uh, in the area. But even then, the schedules typically don't put them back to back for whatever reason. They're on the road to the next city. You might work a Sunday night game, and then five o'clock the next morning, they've got to be on their way to the airport to get the first flight out to where they may be working Monday night or if Monday be an off day, get there a little more extra time to get there on Tuesday. So some of them have faced problems holding together a family. There have been substance abuse issues in the past. One of the things that impressed me further, if I can ramble here just a bit, uh, is Major League Baseball provides not only medical, but also psychological counseling for all of them. I, I was impressed at the amount of care that Major League Baseball takes in terms of supervising, grading I mentioned, uh, but also counseling the umpires. So you, they, they 
emphasize physical fitness as well as uh, you know mental fitness. One of the things I noticed, uh, speaking of that uh, whole fitness thing, in your photos, not only are they all pretty much all smiling, they're very physically fit. Now, again, one of my in, inaccurate, if you will, or whatever uh, prejudicial views of umpires, is as I remember when I was watching games as a kid, a lot of them used to be really out of shape. I mean, you had John McSherry, who was well over 300 pounds with a fatal heart attack on the field in right. 1996, I think. But that does not appear to be the case anymore. And as you say, there's there's a medical director. If uh, Apparently, if an ump takes a sh foul ball shot off the mask and looks like he's got jangled up a bit, they're going to be right on his case concussion-wise and things like that. Could you go into that a little more? Yeah, there's a guy named Mark Latondra who's uh, he's from the state of Maine, but he's based in Phoenix, and uh, he is the the medical director. That I think the staff is five or six people altogether uh, that are available to them. If you get hit, as you mentioned, by a foul ball off the mascot, they will stop the game. Someone from the team will come out. Uh, the ho usually the home team uh, will come out. They have physicians on call at, at all times. And uh, they will give you a quick evaluation, run you through a quick few questions or whatever, you know, concussion protocol. Uh, and they will, you know, bring you out of the game if need be. And then if you're the home plate umpire, which you would be if you were wearing a mask, uh, one of the other guys will come, go in and grab his uh, plate uniform and come out and the, the game will start again rather quickly. And the, the other two will shift positions accordingly as, as need be, but they're very serious about it. and. Uh, if the game goes on, that guy will have a, a phone call with our Mark Latonder after the game, and they'll discuss uh, discuss his situation. Maybe follow up the next day and make sure his everything is clear the morning after. Thanks. Um, you mentioned earlier how they, they told you stories about how they got started to be in the umpiring business, even if it wasn't a business for them when they got started in it. Could you go into that a little more? Some of them started very early. It was kind of a, became a joke after a while uh, to hear about guys that started when they were 10, 12 years old. Maybe, uh, I mean, one guy, his, his mother was the, uh, uh, ran the Little League team or the, the local baseball team in town. And one time the umpire for the game didn't show up. And I think he was 12 at the time. I think it was Doug Eddings, but I'm not 100% sure of that. I don't remember right now. But he said his mother told him, you've got to work the game tonight. He said, I don't want to umpire, you know. And I said, no, you're working the game. And he didn't. He liked it. Uh, and a lot of them, I think they got hooked in the first experience that sometime was, sometimes was random. A couple of them, one guy in particular said, I, I mentioned going to umpire school on a dare. That he, that's how he got involved. Somebody said, you know, I'm going to umpire school. You know, he's made some comment and he said, ah, I dare you to go. And so he did. And he had never conceived of the idea of being an umpire, but he just loved the school and he loved the way that they talked about the profession. And uh, he became an umpire and made it the eight to 10 years that it takes you to get to the, to the major leagues. But these guys were making a dollar a game. I said, so that was your professional first professional gig, right? You're making a dollar a day. You're a pro. Speaking of the umpiring schools, that appears to be, I guess, in these days, the only route into professional umpiring. Can you tell me? I, I gather there are three schools at this point. There used to be two. Now there are three. At any yeah. rate, can you tell me how that works? Yeah, there have been schools over the years, but then others have come into it one way or another. Uh, I mean, back in the early days, sometimes uh, a player would substitute and become an umpire. Cy Young umpired a couple of games. Uh, they just needed somebody to do it instead of not having the game. They would, a couple of players would volunteer. But uh, to become a you know a full fledged professional umpire, you've got to go to umpire school. I went down for three days to visit the Wendelstedt School in Florida back in uh, February 2017. And that was an eye-opening experience for me, I, I, how seriously they all took it. I mean, these are people that are paying a few thousand dollars, of course, to, to go to, uh, to umpire school. Most of them had no hopes of becoming a major league umpire. A typical class might have one or two people 
out of 150 or however many are there that ever make it to the major leagues, some of them will get jobs as, as college umpires or high school or amateur leagues in the area and they might get a little, you know, as a side job and so forth. Some, I think it's just an enjoyable experience There where some people go to fantasy camp and, and play baseball. Uh, the, uh, how seriously they took it impressed me. And one of the things that kind of surprised me was during one of the classroom sessions that I sat in, they put photographs of older umpires up on a screen, like through a slide projector, and asked who that was. And many of them knew. I mean, these are umpires like you mentioned uh, from decades ago, but they, they knew, many of them knew who these guys were. I'd say 80% of them could identify the, the umpire on the screen. And I asked later, you know, why, why do you do that? And they essentially said a reverence for tradition. And so these guys know they're part of a tradition and uh, they understand and appreciate the ones that came before them. I was just impressed and, and surprised that they did that. I see in the background of your office there, uh, Jim, you've got an umpire's print from Norman Rockwell, a pretty famous one. Yes, that is my uh, a, a gift from my mother, who is a who is a Rockwell fanatic in her day, and scored a bunch of signed Rockwell prints at the Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge. And well, she gave me. She, I had my choice, but I was <laughs> that's the one I took, of <laughs> the baseball one. Right. So um, there. The umpiring schools, uh, you know, they, they uh, emphasize the tradition, but apparently one of the things they tell you- I, I got a phone call. Can you hold on to something Yes, here? we'll uh, hold this. I'll be back in a minute. Can you call me back about that? Okay, we're recording again. Something for the editor to do. Good. Um, or not. One of the things that they're told right away is to look around the room, and there are, there are well over 100 students in each class, I gather, 150, something like that. I suppose it depends on the school. Think, well, look around, all of these uh, candidates with you, one of you, and it might be an exaggeration, but apparently isn't much, one of you is going to make the major leagues. So right away, if you had real aspirations, you know how tough it is. Is that, is that, uh, that the case? Yeah, I think that that's impressed on them early. Um, there are, it, it is highly, highly selective. And it's not just because they're, it's not because they're not good enough to make it. It's, it's not that they're calling people safe on a regular basis when they were truly out uh, or they went to the wrong base when a play was happening. Uh, when they finish, they're all very, very good. And many of them do, as I said, get other jobs at other levels. But there are only 76 openings at the moment in the major leagues and most of them are filled by people that it's it's a good paying job and uh once you make it you tend to want to stay uh and as long as you physically or and mentally are able to uh stay a lot of umpires will re retire in their 60s but that's not uncommon uh the trek is about eight to ten years and a lot of people just simply can't hack it. It's just too long. They aren't paying paid that well in the minor leagues, especially the low level minor leagues. They might be getting uh, I don't know, 12, 1500 dollars a month or something like that. Not much money. And so most of them really have to rely on other jobs to get them through the baseball season. And uh, I met any number of people, a couple of people I interviewed early on that working major league games, but uh, then a year or two later, I saw that they weren't and looked up on Facebook and one guy's working and selling real estate and uh, somewhere, he just, he just couldn't last any longer. Kevin O'Connor, who uh, is an umpire observer, he's one of the people that works at Fenway Park, almost every home game, he's there. And he, uh, he's one of the guys that grades the umpires on things like hustle. Are, are they in the right position, but did they get there quickly enough? Uh, they, they grade them on all kinds of, uh, of things. Uh, he, uh, he went about five or six years, I think, and saw no openings. He, the younger group ahead of him, he just didn't see the likelihood that there were going to be retirements. And he went into, uh, in fact, he is in real estate himself. But it's a, it's a long struggle. And uh, one, one of the funny stories I got was a guy had heard this speech. He was, you know, an umpire student first year. 
he'd heard this, this was at the uh, Wendell Stead School, and he'd heard the speech and um, everybody would st stand up and introduce themselves. And uh, so somebody would call up, say, you know, hi, I'm Jim Turner or uh, Jim Overmeyer or wh whatever my name might be. Uh, and then this other guy stood up and said, hi, my name is Hunter Wendelstedt. And it, this guy said, oh, okay, well, there, there's the one guy that's going to make it. It's not going to be me. I might as well leave now. Hunter but was the son of Harry year. who ran the school. <laughs> Harry, Harry was the one that founded it, Harry Wendelstedt. But his son did go through it. And I was, he was out there uh, from even before school days, you know, carrying water out to the guys and stuff as, a, as an apprentice. And I think three guys from the, that very class made it that year. If you have major league aspirations, it, it, you start out, I gather, at class A in the minors or somewhere somewhere down there. And uh, it takes, you said, eight, eight years eight or so to years. even get a shot at the majors. Right. And the way, and they tend to work you in. You become a replacement umpire, a, a call-up or a fill-in umpire. So that if, uh, when once you're in triple A and you've made it through those steps, you might be in double A a couple of years. There was one guy, Phil Cuzzy, who uh, went to umpire school four years, four times, not all back-to-back -back years, but it was only on his fourth year that he was offered a major league job. Uh, he persevered. Uh, but the um, once you get to AAA, you do have the opportunity uh, to get called up to replace an umpire that's on vacation or something, and then they, they do that. Uh, they're going to have you work an awful lot of major league games as a call-up umpire before you're going to get an invitation. Chris Cuccioni, I believe the number was a little over 1,300 games that he worked as a call-up umpire before he was hired. I mean, think about it, that's more than 10 years of work right there. You can work more games per season as a call-up yeah. than some of your actual major league colleagues which yes that, and get paid you get you get paid for it though you get paid at they get paid at first year that. scale so that their pay is quadruple or quintuple or whatever it is compared to what they were making they love that of course uh because they're they're really getting paid and they're building up some tenure so that if they do get hired they might get a, couple, a year or two credit towards their pension depending on how many games they've worked but yeah the average major league umpire works about 120 games this year with vacation time, but also two to three weeks of replay, which doesn't count as a game worked for some reason. They only count the games on the field that, that as uh, games work. Uh, so call-up umpires, I saw guys that one guy worked 159 games. And I said, you mean you only got three days off all season long? And he said, yeah, that's right. And I was happy to get to work. I'm sure he was. Uh, basically, no matter how good these call-up umpires are, and they're and they're probably ready for the majors, or they wouldn't keep asking them to fill in. There's not much. There's 76, re, you know, official major league umpires, and there's not a lot of turnover. I presume. A, a big year might be four guys retire or something of that sort. I was really happy one day. There was a guy named John, John Tumpain who had been working as a call-up umpire for uh, a few years, and. Uh, when I interviewed him, he was working as a call-up umpire, and so I got to know him some in the conversation. And then I think it was a, a couple months later, or even the following, I think it was the following year, he was on John Hirschbeck's crew at first, and then I think it was the following year, or even two years later, because I did this over a four-year period, I heard from Kevin O'Connor, the umpire observer that I mentioned, he said that John had just been hired uh, to the major league staff. He'd got a memo before the game, and so I, I went downstairs, and as John came in and said, hey, I heard you got a nice phone call today. And it was, you know, he said, yes, I, uh, you know, I'm now an official major league umpire. And I, of course, I said, congratulations. You know, when did they call? And he said, about two o'clock this afternoon. And I said, so just three hours ago, you found out. He, he said, I'm, yeah, I'm still, uh, I'm still elevated. I, it got to the point that I, I began asking uh, most of them if they remembered the call. And almost and every one of them, you wait eight or nine years to get a job and they knew the day, they knew where they were at. They uh, remember their reactions. A couple of them broke down crying. One of them was in a restaurant. He said he broke down crying and people in the restaurant were wondering what's wrong with this guy. He was there with his wife and his, his family. And uh, it's just so emotional to be able to make it after you put in that much work. So all along uh, the fill-in umpires and the regular umpires, 
there's this constant grading system, which is made possible by video these days. Right. Uh, I remember one of your, and they're all very proud of their high scores. And I said, why? Doctors don't get the kind of scores we get. So how are they, is this like a daily grading system or, or just sort of periodic? Nobody actually showed it to me. I would love to have seen it. I, maybe I could have pushed a little harder, but apparently every night within a couple of hours, a few hours after the game, they have uh, something they can access to the internet. If they've work, been working in the home, home plate for the game, they, they will get a ranking of how many balls and strikes they got wrong. Now, of course, video is not necessarily perfect either, but um, th they get that ranking. And it's a rare guy that isn't 96, 97% uh, percent correct. Uh, same thing, even more higher ranking on the, on the field, I'm sure. But um, the, uh, they do get this information. As I mentioned, they'll get graded on not just whether the guy was safe or out and they made that call right, but whether they were, whether they hustled to get to the base on time. They, the, the observer will watch a guy, say a ball is hit to, uh, say there's a guy on second base, say there's a guy on first base and a guy hits a ball to left field. Well, once the base runner rounds first base, the first base umpire is going to have to watch to be sure, is he going to come back to the bag or is he going to go on to second? And, and there's a little bit of a rotation that goes on because one of them's got a second base umpire might have run out to, well, he's going to be there for the guy in first base, but the third base umpire might have gone out to anticipate where the ball was going to land. I never went to umpire school officially, so I couldn't tell you all what they're supposed to do. But they do get graded on, on this, and, uh, and that all counts eventually. And there's... Um... They're balls and strikes. We don't. It's not what we see on uh, TV or on uh, the MLB uh, internet thing. But there is a ball and strike. Yes, yeah, they do rank on, on balls and strikes too. And I suppose one day we may see automated strike zone. The, the, the technology is there. I, you know, I, umpires. You mentioned some of the unfortunate calls that umpires have made. I do believe that people, it wasn't just lip service. I do believe that most umpires really do welcome instant replay because of what Jim Joyce went through when uh, Galarraga had pitched, he, he did pitch a perfect game, but on the final 27th out, uh, Jim Joyce called the runner safe. There was no replay available or he would have initiated a, a, a replay, I think just to be sure, but it wasn't available at that time. So. He said he went back into the, well, the, ne the next guy made it out. So he, uh, th the game was over. The guy always had a shutout, but that's a whole different thing from a perfect game. The minute he got back into the umpire's room, he called up the videotape that access they have there. And he saw that his call was wrong. And he, he opened the door to talk to the guy from the, the pool reporter from the press corps. And he said, I blew the call. I, I was wrong. That was a perfect game. And uh, how bad could you possibly feel about depriving a young kid, a guy from Venezuela, you know, maybe I can remember how old he was, uh, but a chance of baseball immortality. And, uh, you know, he would have done anything to be able to have reversed that call or get it right. Uh, now they have that opportunity to do that. And it's not just the manager might protest a call. Umpires themselves will with some frequency have a crew chief review. Well, they want to make sure they got the call right. That was the, just the, the very first thing that impressed me from talking to these umpires was how they lost sleep, not a Jim Joyce call, that's an extraordinary thing, but just an average call uh, that they, if they get a call wrong, they will lose sleep over it. They want to be perfect if they, they want can. To be perfect. Yeah. And they don't seem, I, I'm surprised how many of, uh, some of the people who interviewed said, well, yeah, there's just a replay and it kind of left it at that. But a lot of them would say, yeah, it's a good thing. And yeah, I mean, you, a, see them, you see them huddling there near the stands and they don't look like they're smiling very much and are waiting for their colleagues in New York to get back to them with a call and they just don't look that happy about it. But apparently, not only did a lot of them not mind, but they think it's a good deal. Well, you wouldn't be happy that your call is in question, but that's because it was a close play. Uh, they're in some suspense, probably hoping that their call is, is upheld. And then some percentage of them are, are overturned. You can see reports on, uh, on percentages of calls that are, that are upheld or overturned.
we see them sitting there and occasionally seem to be talking, but when they're on the headsets, they are not hearing the conversation in New York, as I asked about that. They've got the headsets on, the crew chief and the calling umpire. Uh, and uh, the people in New York ask them, okay, just, you know, have anything to say, okay. And then they flip a switch and it goes silent. So they cannot hear the deliberations of the people talking in New York. And then it comes back on and they give them the answer and they get back to play the game as soon as they can. I do believe that it's not just from the personal standpoint of not being saddled with a really unfortunate call, but that they do care. 90% of them, 90% of the time, at least, I maybe I should, I'm being unfair by not putting in a higher percentage, but uh, that they, they really want to get the call right for the integrity of the game. I mean, yeah, everybody has a day where they're, they're doing their job just to do their job, but rarely did I have that impression that uh, any of these guys were going through the motion on any given given day. We know that it has to happen as, as human beings, but and that they have maybe had a some kind of thing that they got a phone call about before that hand that's that's on their minds. But uh, I asked them, do you anticipate calls if you've got a you know pitcher that has a certain uh, characteristic, you know, do you anticipate that pitch? And they say, we can't afford to, you know, you could be off just a little bit if you anticipate a pitch. They also will say that an hour after the game, if you run into them a restaurant, at a restaurant and ask them what the score was, most of them couldn't tell you what the score was because that was immaterial to them. They know which team won usually, partly because if it's the home team that won the, the game ended the in the half innings. <laughs> or maybe it was 13 innings, but still they didn't have to play the bottom part of half of the inning. So they'd remember that part. But uh, basically, uh, if it was six to four, three to one, if it was shut out, they'd probably remember that. And, uh, and they're aware of the players. They know who these players are. They know uh, the position players. They know they can talk knowledgeably about somebody as a, as a hitter, uh, not just because of watching them when they're at the plate, because they're not watching the hitter, they're watching the ball. So uh, there's this, there's an issue that comes up occasionally in your interviews, but and some people will acknowledge it, and some people these are the the older umpires who've been around for a while, and some people will talk about it, but it's very important to the uh, business of being a big league umpire. What happened in 1999? Well, that was something that, of course, some people were reluctant to talk about, but there was a, a so-called strike. It was actually a mass resignation where the umpires uh, were negotiating with Major League Baseball and didn't get what they want. And they figured that the approach would be to resign and that Major League Baseball would have to cave then. That's not what happened. Uh, Major League Re Baseball said, we're, you know, we're not caving. You get a chance. We send your resignation now and go back to work or you're fired, in effect. And 22 of them uh, did not rescind their resignation. 22 of them were relieved of their positions. Uh, most of them didn't come back, but about, I don't remember, four or five of them did come back. Uh, I mentioned Phil Cuzzy before. He's a, a veteran umpire, but he's the guy that took him four times through umpire school before he got hired. He was one, his father was a union man and he, he resigned and he was brand new umpire. Uh, he did not come back and finally, you know, he had a chance meeting at a hotel where he was working as a, a steward or something of that sort, uh, a host of, of some sort. And his sister who, who was worked at the hotel told him that Len Coleman, the National League uh, president was staying at the hotel. And so he uh, got all dressed up and you know, made it a personal appeal to him. Uh, he'd written him a letter and he, he dropped off the letter and then uh, asked if he could get an appeal. And the Coleman uh, talked to him and saw his, felt his sincerity and said, you know, you, you can apply again, but you're going to have to start at the bottom. And, uh, and it, it worked. He, he went back to single A ball and, and worked his way up. And now he's, uh, he's been doing that for quite some time. He's one of the guys that would have been an art teacher if he hadn't, uh, gone back to umpire school, but it was just in his, his blood. Ed Hickox uh, was another umpire that, that resigned and he became a police officer in, the, or in uh, Daytona Beach area of Florida. And uh, he still works at that during the off season. 
in fact, since we have an extended off season now, uh, he's probably working as, as a police detective. To sum up, um, what's the best thing in, in, their, in the umpire's opinion, what's the best thing about being a major league umpire and what's the worst thing? Best thing is you get a chance to do interviews with people. No, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not really the best thing. Uh, I think the best thing is that most of them love the game. Uh, they love being associated with the game. They're at a high level uh, of um, the top of their profession. And there's a, a feeling of, of self-satisfaction, I think, that goes with that. Uh, they are paid reasonably well when you are, um, you can get up to 400 some thousand dollars after you've got a few years of seniority in, which for a season that's more or less nine months long with spring training and if you work the playoffs or not, um, that's pretty good. Uh, it's not as good as minimum wage for a baseball player, but they're not baseball players. They're, uh, they're major league umpires. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, they adapt to the travel. And so some of them will, you know, enjoy visiting certain cities. They get to know restaurants or maybe they have friends there. And so they drop in and see them once or twice a year. They do form friendships with other umpires. And uh, so there's, there is a fraternity. And I say fraternity because so far we're still waiting for the first female major league umpire, but there, there is a fraternity among umpires and uh, they, there's a real sense of solidarity and uh, they've all gone through the same, same thing to get there. They all live through the same challenges and that, that creates bonds with somebody you maybe even only see once or twice a year. Okay. Um, one last thing uh, for me anyway, is um, I noticed that uh, one of you got help in the book from somebody you've had a long relationship and yes. so I, Larry Gerlach, who's a senior member of a Sabre and I guess, uh, although you may adopt his mantle, the uh, up to now anyway, the Sabre guru of umpiring. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Larry. I had meant to at the beginning, but I didn't. Uh, he was my mentor throughout this whole process. We worked together. We, Sabre did a book on scouts back in 2011 that I worked on with uh, the late Jim Sandoval, who was the scouting expert. And I was lucky to learn a lot about scouts by working with Jim. I uh, thought of the idea of working uh, a similar book on umpires, and Larry was naturally the guy I approached. He wrote a book 40 years ago called The Men in Blue, and that was a similar kind of book based on extended conversations with, with umpires, talking about their craft, their profession, and their lives. And uh, he, uh, he signed on immediately. We, in 2017, we put out the, the Sabre Book of Umpire, as, um, the Sabre Book of Umpires and Umpiring which is available through the Sabre site and, and elsewhere. And then I just enjoyed talking to these guys for that book, and I just wanted to keep going. So uh, for parts of five seasons over a four-year period, 2015 through 2019, I, uh, I interviewed all these guys. But every one of them, after I transcribed the interview, I would send it to Larry and uh, for his, any comments that he has. And often, if a new crew was coming in, for instance, uh, Rob Drake is going to be in uh, this next uh, homestand. Got any questions you think I should ask him? Or he was aware of the book and how it was developing and maybe areas that uh, had, hadn't been touched on enough in some of the other interviews. So he would always give me an idea for a new question that I could ask. It really worked out nicely. Then he wrote the introduction for the book too, which I very much appreciated. Is there, uh, I always ask at the end, inter, at the end of interviews, because I always miss something. Anything else you'd like to say about the book? Not really. I, I just, just in general, it was, I've done a lot of books these days. And uh, in some ways, this was the most fulfilling book that I have ever done. Maybe it's partly because it's recent, but it, it wasn't just telling a player's story or something. It was going into an area that I hadn't ever thought about that much as a fan. I mean, you see the umpires emerge from the ground, hole in the ground and then they go back into the hole in the ground after the game. And maybe there's a controversy of one kind or another, but I hadn't really thought that much about them. And so it was, it really opened a whole lot of new perspectives uh, on the game uh, to me. And I, I found that, I found it really rewarding, sort of like the story behind the story in some ways. It was for me. <laughs> <laughs> when I read it. 
So the book is available from, uh, well, through the, the Pandemic Baseball Book Club website. We link to bookshop.org, which gives a portion of their profits to independent bookstores. And where else can people get the book? Well, if, if you've got a local bookstore that's open in your area, that's certainly a place you can get it. There are the online sources such as Amazon and, and Barnes and Noble that uh, that sell the books as well. And uh, Summer Game Books, of course, has their own website and they'd be happy to sell you one directly and to see what else they publish. Okay, well, thanks very much, Bill. It's been highly informative and a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you.